please watch the earlier video for an introduction to this one. Before I begin the main portion of this video, I must introduce some context. The University of California excavations at Kiribet and Nahas opened up three excavation areas. Area A, in the gate area of the fort, Area S, around a copper processing building, and Area M, at a slag mound in the southeastern part of the site. All areas yielded radiocarbon samples, and all radiocarbon dates from the site were from the 7th or late 12th to late 9th centuries BC. Only areas A and S yielded published pottery. The history of Area A is described by the excavators as thus. In stratum 4A, the bottommost stratum, a layer of slag and other sediment about two-fifths of a meter thick was laid over the area. After that, in stratum 3B, the gate was erected, and the chambers were filled with a quarter meter thick layer of gravel and reddish-brown sediment. In stratum 3A, the gate was modified, and a wall, formerly attributed by the excavators to stratum 1, was built to block the gate's opening. Apparently, in this phase, the gate was turned into a private residence. In stratum 2B, the gate chambers were filled with metallurgical waste, slag, and ash. In stratum 2A, after a collapse of the gate superstructure, some installations, used according to the excavators for copper working, were built into the gate collapse. After these installations were abandoned, further collapse occurred in stratum 1. The questions we must deal with are, when was the fort built? Did the excavators get the stratigraphy of Kirbet and Nahas correct? And was Kirbet and Nahas significantly inhabited after its phases as a copper processing site? To do so, we must review the plan and the location of the Kirbet and Nahas fort. The first square fort we know of in the history of the Kingdom of Judah is Arad Stratum 11, built in the late Iron 2A, probably in the second quarter of the 9th century BC when Kirbet and Nahas was still an active copper processing center. The fort is slightly smaller than that found at Kirbet and Nahas. Its plan, however, is remarkably different, especially in the matter of its gate. Thus, it is extremely difficult to associate the Kirbet and Nahas fortress with 9th century BC Judah. We should, therefore, see if conditions present in later periods better explain the origin of the Kirbet and Nahas fortress. After the subjugation of Damascus by Assyria in 796 BC, the Kingdom of Israel under Joash and Jeroboam II rose to its height in the 1st and 2nd quarters of the 8th century BC. During this period of economic prosperity in the southern Levant, control of the routes from Arabia, a land of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, to Israel was a near necessity. Thus, two fortresses were built by the Kingdom of Judah on the road between Gaza and the Gulf of Aqaba. These fortresses were Kuntilet Arjurud and Ein el Kuderat. Kuntilet Arjurud is unmentioned in the Bible, but it is frequently mentioned in popular literature relating to the Bible. This is due to the discovery of curious cultic inscriptions there, including those mentioning Yahweh of Timon, Yahweh of Samaria, and Yahweh and Asherata. The pottery at Kuntilet Arjurud was entirely Judahite, Israelite, and Philistine. No handmade Negabite ware was found at the site, proving it was a caravansary established by the Kingdom of Judah, not an outpost established by nomads. Ein el Kuderat is a fortress mentioned in the Bible as being on the southern border of Judah. It was, like Kuntilet Ajrud, founded in the 8th century BC, probably, judging by its plan, and location in that century's first half. A stone-paved structure, possibly a cultic building, was found in its northeast corner. In this possible cultic building was found a handmade incense burner. 
This also suggests that the Ain el Kuderat fortress was built in the first half, not the second half of the 8th century BC, as Hezekiah's cultic reforms led at least one temple in the southern part of his kingdom, and probably more, to close. Both Kuderat and Ajrud were roughly similar in plan, though Kunti de Tajrud is only one-fifth the size of the Ain el Kuderat fortress. It is apparent that in the first three quarters of the 8th century BC, the spice road from Arabia led directly to Gaza by way of these two fortresses. However, after the Assyrian Empire made Judah and Edom into vassal states, Kuntil et Ajrud was abandoned. Edom, however, flourished, building a new capital at Buzera, biblical Basra. During this period, at least two square forts in the Arava were either built or expanded, certainly under the direction of Assyria, the regional superpower of the time. The first was at Ein Hatseba, probably to be identified with the biblical Tamar, located on the road from Judah to Edom. The Iron Age 2B fort had two phases of construction. The first phase was a 50 meter square fort fortified with an offset's inset's casemate wall. Its plan is very similar to that of Arad Strata 10 to 8, the only major difference being that the gate at Arad is two chambered, rather, as at En Hatseba, four chambered. The earlier phase of the Iron 2B fortress at En Hatseba may have been Judahite or Assyrian. The second phase was a hundred meter square fort, also with an offset's inset's casemate wall certainly built under the direction of the Assyrians. The second Assyrian-era square fort we know of in the Arava was a Tel Kelefe, probably to be identified with the biblical Elat. Like Ein Hatseba, Iron Age Tel Kelefe had two major building phases, the first being a casemate fortified compound, 44 meters square, with casemates similar to those at Ein Kuderat. During this early building phase, an administrative building of the Iron Age 2A, 2B, Cisjordanian, and Southern Aramean lateral access podium style was built in the center of the fort. The presence of this building strongly suggests that this fort was built by a Judahite architect, and probably, as the Bible states, in the reign of Azariah in the second quarter of the 8th century BC. The second major building phase at Iron Age Tel Kelefe was a 56 meter square fort with an offset's inset's wall similar to that at Arad 10 through 8. This major building phase evidently lasted longer than the first one and, after its destruction, was reused during most of the Persian period. This fort had, like Ein Hatseva, a four chambered gate and was certainly built under the direction of the Assyrians. It is therefore evident that, sometime in the late 8th century BC, the Assyrians decided to reroute the Arabian trade from the direct desert road by Kunti de Tajrud and Ain el Kuderat to the route along the Beersheba Valley and the Wadi Araba. As anyone can tell, the forts along these routes are quite similar to that at Kirbet and Nahas. Indeed, the closest architectural parallel to the Kirbet and Nahas fortress comes from the Assyrian one at Tel Kelefe. Also, Kirbet and Nahas happens to be situated on the road between Ein Hatseba and Basra. However, the strongest evidence that Kirbet and Nahas was not just refounded as a fort, but was a thriving settlement in the Iron Age 2B to C comes not from the architecture, but from the pottery found there. The majority of the pottery found at Kirbet and Nahas was Iron Age 2B and or C, that is, 8th to 7th century BC. Among the most notable examples of this Iron Age 2B to C pottery is a local variety of the Assyrian style bowl, used in Assyrian centers in the Kingdom of Gaza and widely imitated in the kingdom of Ashkelon and in the highlands of Edom. Such bowls, typically made in Edom, are also found in large quantities on the trade routes between Edom and Philistia. How could this be? 
It is most likely that the gate of the fort was founded upon iron one to two a remains, then immediately had a podium constructed inside it with the gravel attributed to stratum three, and the waste attributed to stratum two b. After the fort went out of use, the architecture of the gate was modified so that a residence could be created out of it. After the abandonment of this residence, the walls of the gate collapsed, and the pit installations attributed to stratum 2A, which had nothing to do with copper working, were built into the collapse. After those installations' abandonment, the collapse attributed to stratum 1 occurred. Area S, as well, seems to have been occupied intensively during the Assyrian era. Stratum 2B is clearly associated with copper processing. Thus, the only stratum that can be safely associated with Assyrian era occupation is stratum 2A, when the copper processing structure was reused and expanded, and the stratum 2B surface was covered over with a fill. Thus, the Kirbet and Nahas fort cannot date to the time of Solomon or be associated with the kingdom of Judah. Indeed, Kirbet and Nahas was transformed into a thriving settlement under the Assyrians. The question now comes to Thomas Levy's motives for his sensationalism. His actions, such as his interviewing of Richard Elliot Friedman, show he is not a fundamentalist. In an interview on the Landmines radio show, almost all of the discussion was centered around utterly unsensational subjects. Thus, it is probable his sensationalism is not purposeful. It appears that, as Levy participated in his first excavation in Israel at Gezer in the early 70s, when the patriarchs were still believed to be historical figures, Levy's sensationalism is merely an accidental result of being rather behind the times when it comes to archaeological historical paradigms. Thank you for watching.